Hey, it says meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. I think I'm just waiting for YouTube live. Yeah, I'll show it after that goes off because <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, but no, it was it was awful. Having to be putting myself into a high risk situation. Oof. Being oh, high risk. Oh, yes. Okay, I'm gonna send you guys the link in the chat here and then I'm gonna yes. post uh, TCAP. Oh, in the Zoom chat here? Yeah, I'm gonna send it in the Zoom chat and I'm gonna post it to the camera effect Facebook and everything. Sick. I'll uh when you post it to the camera effect Facebook, I will share it from there so I the traffic goes to you guys. Bless. Thank you. You're welcome. I Thank see you. it on YouTube. All right. I'll be like, due to technical difficulties. <laughs> due to technical difficulties. All right, I'm sharing it on Facebook from YouTube. Today's stream is now live on YouTube. YouTube Live. Damn, there's already two likes on it. Already? Right. Yeah. Oh, damn. Hey, there's two people that liked it. You guys are <laughs> rad. You guys are the early innovators. <laughs> And one of those was me. Because <laughs> why right. not? You are it's live, an early it's live on the page. Oh. It's live on the page. Welcome to Chili. Yeah, like <laughs> there we go. All right. Hell yes. And there's already two likes on it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh my God. Whenever I look at my interviews back, I realize, like, I don't know what it is but i end up sounding more nasally when i look over the interviews versus i, I think i sound yeah <laughs> part of the reason with my patent pending one i was not on the camera because i don't like being on camera i feel that actually <laughs> i don't because i'm kind of an attention hog <laughs> so welcome to the camera effect podcast my name is jamie kaufman i'm here with my co-host and fellow photographer for the podcast or for the publication. Nice, nice. So I am. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Camera Effects Podcast. My name is Jamie Kaufman. I set fires to feel joy. And I am <laughs> assistant editor and host for the podcast. Uh, today we are joined by uh, my special co-host for today <laughs> and one of our fellow photographers, Cheyenne. Hey, guys. And we are joined by our extra special um, guest with us today, photographer and guitarist for the bands Cold Harbor and Bro Job. Hello. Bro Job does not need any further introduction. You should know by you should know about Bro Job. <laughs> if you don't. One what word. What's wrong with you? Booty shorts. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> Ooh, I got updates about that, by the way. Oh God! <laughs> yes, I'm here. So what is the update on the booty shorts since you just brought it up? Oh, so we, so we have a good friend that listens to us uh, in Australia. His name is uh, Josh James. And not only am I partial to him because we share the same <laughs> name, but also he, he hooked us up with these. Uh, so I guess there's like this brand in Australia called Budgie Smugglers. And they're basically Speedos. <laughs> And, oh my god yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah so he made us all like custom speedos um that has like our stage names on the back and he mailed them to us a while ago so mine hasn't shown up yet but i'm checking my mail like every day <laughs> that <laughs> is glorious that Trevor's is the tea his. trevor sent a not suitable for work picture to the band chat <laughs> that's fair <laughs> i mean i would too <laughs> like i'm that one person who's like oh 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 you wanted you wanted um you wanted boundaries i have none <laughs> what are boundaries i i don't understand this like in my no upcoming... such thing as boundaries and yeah, exactly like in my stand-up routine i always say like i need you to know that every line of yours i'm gonna cross it and then turn around and snort it <laughs> <laughs> so let's get this started so you are in two projects bro job and 
your personal baby, Cold Harbor. Um, what have like, what are your individual musical influences and how did they kind of come together to create Cold Harbor? Oh, I mean, it, that's kind of an abstract answer because I don't really, uh, I don't really draw from like a handful of, I guess, uh, you know, bands or whatever when I write, like I more so like draw from like the sounds I've heard and the themes I've heard and the music that I've listened to in the past. So like, <laughs> it, <laughs> It really like starts from when I started getting into the genre. And it's funny because one of the first albums that got me into heavier music, <laughs> and everyone's gonna, everyone's gonna hate me for this. I know the guys in my band make fun, both bands make fun of me for it, but uh, the album Weathered by Creed. Ooh. But, but hear me out. The song Bullets on that album has this, if you just dismiss the vocals for a second and listen to like the guitars, the riff in that song goes hard as fuck. <laughs> yes. And I was like, that's the kind of stuff that, so like that or like, I mean, there's another band called like the Dolly Thundering Concept that I really, really enjoy. Um, old school, Thy Art is Murder. I like their new stuff. I just, I don't know, it's nothing that they haven't done before yeah which is i guess is why it doesn't stick out to me as much you know i like when i hear like a band that is familiar in sound but continues to evolve so definitely and that's completely agree that's definitely a, a point that i have like in my musical history just like getting into <laughs> different genres like i was listening to like a bunch of hardcore bands earlier today and i'm just like it's just same note over and over and over like it gets boring yeah I mean I, I you know I think I think just like anything like the genres you listen to are definitely like what you you know it's an acquired taste everyone likes something different you know there's something for everyone and that's kind of why I love the metal genre so much because there's so many like there's something for everyone in it you know and sure. you don't realize that outside looking in but once you get into the genre you're like oh like, this is actually pretty chill. There is something for me here. Yeah, there's like 150,000 different subgenres of metal. Yeah, like, and like me personally, like, I'm not the biggest fan of like traditional hardcore, but I also still enjoy it, you know? No. Like, my, uh, my old buddy, uh, Danny, um, he lives out in Oklahoma now, but him and I used to play in this band like back in 2014. Uh, it was just a local band here to Cincinnati called The Few The Fallen. And it was like my metalcore, like August Burns Red style influences, clashes with like Confide and like Danny's influences were like Confide and Dillinger's Escape Plan and stuff like that. So it was like this really weird mixture, but it kind of, you know, worked Oh yeah, I actually am. I, I know a few of the Confide guys because they've been doing like a few like reunions recently. Like they oh, shit. Like back in 2018, uh, they did uh, Shout the Truth in its entirety with the original lineup. Wow. And uh, like when they've been doing reunions, it's just the original lineup from the recording. Um, and they've been like, what's it? They did the Warp Tour 25th anniversary um, reunion. So shout out to Jeff if you're watching. Miss you. What up, Jeff? I'm Josh. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Cheyenne, you want to do the next one? Okay. So where did the name Cold Harbor come from? Oh, okay. So we're tapping into my nerdy side here now. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know Bring nerdy, on like, all the nerd. Well, everything's well, we're here for it. We're, we're taking here it. For it. Exactly. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. Thanks. But uh, so I, I haven't played this game in a really long time, but um, I've always been like an Elder Scrolls fan. So like I played like Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim, and I uh, bought Elder Scrolls Online. I was like, this is 20 bucks. And it's like probably the most massive game I've ever seen with like literally hundreds of hours of gameplay. So that's what got me into that game. I'm playing it and there's this domain in the game called Cold Harbor. And one of the demons of oblivion his name is molag ball lives th this is like his domain cold harbor and what struck me about it was like not only 
it, it wasn't really the name that stood out to me at first about it. It was more so like the visuals around like in that domain. It was like really dark and blue. And I was like, man, this is like, I don't know. This is kind of like an aesthetic a little bit paired with the name. So it just kind of like fit. I brought it up to Jake and then next thing you know, Cold Harbor was born. <laughs> oh, I like yeah, it. That's what's up. So to those who have never heard but either of your bands before, like how would you describe them? Ooh. Well, I guess I'll just give you the un the unfiltered description of both. I'll try to describe them as frankly as possible. Uh, so bro job is like bro job is is like comedy metal. So you gotta view it in that light or else you just aren't gonna understand it. Plain and simple, period. Yeah. But then when you get into it, it's got, if you've ever heard of the band Meshuga, yeah, it's got like a very similar, like in certain regards, it's got like somewhat of a similar feel, like with the crazy rhythms that like are mind bending, but just with like all these dick jokes and everything, it's like this super, I don't know, it's such a unique attitude. It makes it like really fun and makes you want to dance, you know? Oh, and then Cold Harbor, I would say is more so like, I, I don't know, like, because I, Cold Harbor is my baby, so, like, when I think of it, I get really descriptive with it, and I think of, like, music that, like, you listen to when you're in a really well-insulated venue, you know, and the sound is just incredible, and just every hit means something, and then, like, the atmosphere just surrounds you and sucks you into the music, and that's, I don't know, it's got, like, a cinematic value to it, and I love that stuff. Oh, certainly. We definitely need Cold Harbor to play a venue that isn't that random Santa Ana venue. <laughs> With the, what, what did they have going on next door there? What was that? Was that like a wedding or something? I have no idea, but I just remember the PA system just being two speakers. <laughs> and like something that I, that's really cool about Bro Job that I realized is you guys basically line everything into the PA. Yeah, so we had... We had the kick trigger, both guitars, the bass, and the backtrack going through two speakers. Yeah, that was that was a that was fine. Oh, and vocals. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cannot forget about the vocals. Obviously, vocals. <laughs> that was a fun time, though. I will say, I love I love when you're just um, Jacob gets on stage and he just goes. So we've seen a lot of pants on here tonight. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna change that. <laughs> Just we all actually just bought matching breakaway pants. So we're going to have like the full on button up pants. Like, and when he says that, we're just going to like tear them off. Yes. yes. <laughs> Getting into drag queen territory with these reveals. I live for it. <laughs> it's got to be gripping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. So Shiny. after you dropped your EP titled The Ringer, Growing Pains, and the newest oh. being Stoned to Death, what? The EP was titled The Herd. Yeah, the yeah. Herd. Oh, <laughs> the Ringer I'm was going, the M&M Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dropped. Sorry, I am tired as hell right now. <laughs> oh, no, you you're trust good. me? <laughs> you worked a long shift, girl? You good. Yes, I did. I feel you. I slept after, in. yeah, I woke up late and ne- downed my coffee this morning in 10 minutes. Oof. I got home this morning from work at 5 a.m. So I feel you. I haven't <laughs> worked in four months. <laughs> I'm jealous, anyway. honestly. <laughs> oh. I miss it. <laughs> yeah. Let me repeat the question. We'll start over there. <laughs> so after you dropped the EP titled The Herd in 2018, you've dropped three singles titled The Ringer, Growing Pains, and the newest being Stoned to Death what was the writing process for those songs and what was the feedback from it so the ringer um that, that's kind of the black sheep of cold harbor a little bit there we all have mixed opinions on it um jake and i originally started talking about that song because uh eminem dropped his new album and Jake just thought that was like the sickest song ever. And he showed it to me and I was like, you know what? You could actually make a cool metal cover to this. And <laughs> I honestly, hindsight, I probably should have spent more time on the song. I like it as it is, but I wrote it in like one day. And um, 
and tracked it and sent it off to Connor Rivling from uh, Hollowed Studios. He does all of our mixing and mastering. Dude is a whiz with that stuff. Um, but yeah, so I wrote it in like one day and I was just kind of trying to feel out like the original beat and like where like the, the kick drums were and like the, the 808s and everything that were in the original song. And another thing that we tried to do with that song is um, we tried to replicate like vocally um, as like perfect as possible. So we spent a lot of time on the vocals and like getting all like the little like weird inflections that Eminem does like in the background and stuff in between beats that just make it something, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it, that song got a mixed amount of feedback. Um, I, it still holds a special place in my heart though. I think it's gonna become, you know, one of those like little posters in our backlog that people look back on and they're like, you know what? This is pretty sick. I mean, it's like eight minutes long, but it's still pretty sick. <laughs> Damn, that's like rap god levels. <laughs> yeah, that's a long song. Um, but then uh, Growing Pains. So I don't really know what I was feeling for the writing process on that. I was just kind of like, when I write, I try to just think of like, sometimes I'll just have like a riff pop into my head. And then I, that's like the starting point of the whole song. And then things may get moved around, like the riff may be in like the middle of the song. It may start, like start the song, or it may be at the end. You know, it really just depends. But I just build the song, my songs around the original riff that I come up with that I think is catchy enough to be, you know, good enough for, or you know, for publishing. Um, and so that's what kind of where Growing Pains kind of started. Like I just started. I think I started from that like intro riff. That's like. Fun, da -da -da -da, da -da, you know um and I just built the song around that and I don't know I, I also like with my writing style like I was saying earlier I like adding that cinematic um feel so like there's lots of like drones and like clean guitars that just like really fill the gaps you know and give it an atmosphere and then stone to death was kind of like the same the same deal you know except the original riff that I wrote for it was, well, actually, you know what? I take that back. Stone to Death was different. Uh, I guess I have a dynamic writing process. <laughs> I don't know. Because I take inspiration from like a whole bunch of different things. But I originally wrote Stone to Death in 2017 when I was living out in Utah. And it was like, you know, it was like, okay. And I, but, and it just needed some pieces that I, needed to be like reworked and stuff. So I revisited it and pretty much kind of rehauled the entire song. And so there's like, if you heard the original demo, you'd be like, oh, I see where he got that from. But the new one is just, it's so much better than the original demo, so. <laughs> Hell yeah. And what's the reception been like on the thing, on the two newest ones? It's been great. Honestly, I think, I think Stone to Death has done a little bit better just cause it appeals more to that heavier side of our, uh, our image and our sound. Um, but I, I also think Growing Pains did incredibly well and it was, it's promising for us because that not only was that our first song was singing, but that's the first time Jake has ever sang on a song, period, ever. That's the first time the world has heard Jake singing. And, oh yeah, and I actually shared that to my Instagram story today of specifically the clip of the Queens. Yeah, yes. it's amazing and you know, and one thing I, I won't let Jake take all the credit for this. We, uh, <laughs> our, uh, our bassist at the time, Chris, he did the first high harmony, like the first part at that singing part, like above Jake. And then I did the second part, um, the second harmony part above Jake. And then it just like, our voices just kind of meshed well and it just turned into what it, what it is, you know? <laughs> Hell yeah, we love a good three-part harmony over here. It was weird. We were just like, I don't know. I mean, Chris's voice sounds better there. And then, you know, then it got to the higher notes, and then it was like, oh, Josh's voice sounds better there. And I'm not a great singer, so it took me a while to track that. <laughs> well, it sounded good, so that's all that matters. Thanks. You camouflaged it. You made it. <laughs> Slay Queen. 
<laughs> Thanks, so man. With Bro Job, you've finally hit the road twice now with the band. Yes. Um, what's been that? What, what's the experience been like finally being able to translate those songs live to a much broader audience of people? Honestly, I, I you know, listening to Bro Job is one thing. Like when you when you first get introduced to Bro Job, it is like I think like at least for me when I first listened to it this is kind of what I'm drawing my opinion from I suppose um it struck me as like the heaviest thing I think I've ever heard the first song I heard from bro job was talk shit get kissed Yo. and I was like what is this and why are they screaming about wieners <laughs> but I was like hooked because it was so damn heavy and I don't know like I think I think that's a maybe i don't know if i'm the only one that has like that i don't know what, what would you guys say your impression is because i feel like that's probably yeah in general yeah that's, that was my exact <laughs> thing i mean when i was listening to it i mean i'm a very flamboyant gay had homosexual man <laughs> so hearing about songs that have to do with wieners and shit i was like wow a song that has to do with my life that's not sung by drag queens that I can dance to and mosh to. Exactly. <laughs> like, I was, like, walking around my house today because I do that, like, the day that I'm interviewing a band, I'll just start, like, walking around the house, like, blasting their music, and I just found myself twerking. Like, most of the songs <laughs> are for four time, so, like, it, you can get, like, that good, like, twerk on. Hey, you know what? That's what I do. When I cook dinner, I always, uh, I always <laughs> put on some, like, heavy-ass music on my Bluetooth speaker, and I'm like, hmm. Like, walking around my kitchen, like, dancing and cooking. <laughs> oh boy. So to interrupt that little conversation I'm on the uh, YouTube, uh, we got some comments. Chris says hi and that hi, we Chris. love nerds. Uh, also, she says boy band incoming, <laughs> which I'm not boy sure band. exactly what that come what's about. Then Christine says hi. And then hi, um, we have uh, Beneath Black Sales says, what's up, Josh? Huge fan. We butt Benny. chug some. Uh, is that Jamaican in Louisville? And his name's Sam. Sam. Or or girl, not sure. <laughs> Could go either way. Well, Sam, I can't remember your face right now, but hi, and I will probably remember you when I see you again. Whenever this virus freaking ends. So right. Get back to normal. <laughs> Miss Rona be fucking up all of our shit. <laughs> God. Okay. Man, it's happening into some emotion. <laughs> like, I feel like I feel like I have to start singing Whitney Houston right now. I get <laughs> so no, but yeah, no, getting on. back to the question though. Um sorry that we I trailed off. That's my bad. But Bro Job Live is like it, it took some like putting together. Um, you know, it took a few shows to really dial in the way we wanted to approach our live show, but now it's like it is Honestly, Connor Reibling is the architect behind it. And the dude just, I mean, he's just as good with live sound as he is with mixing and mastering. So shout out Connor for real. He's a freaking prodigy. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, he really turned it into like, I mean, I love playing it because it's like that head bobbing music, you know, like yeah. live, you can't help but like bob your head. Even if the sound is shit. <laughs> exactly. We had a fun time. My, yeah. friends, my friends in King Shamer um, opened up the show. That was actually their very first gig. Was, really? Was that I show. remember they were pretty fucking good. And they brought an inflatable tit ball. And yeah. during Bro Job set, we were all just like, for some reason, no one was moshing, which I was kind of like, cool. I already have a concussion. I don't have to worry about it. So, <laughs> um, so we were all just like bouncing around this giant ass titty ball. <laughs> and it was glorious oh geez <laughs> so they said that it's sammy clifford what a nerd and then um chris says the boy band thing when we were talking about vocals and harmonies and oh. then we're going back to sam says he kissed my entire band on their butt cheeks i can't believe he forgot us whoa <laughs> maybe i was drunk I don't know. Maybe I have to drink more to remember that. Maybe I have to get the same mindset to have this recall. Isn't that like something that happens in psychology with the human brain or something? It sounds you have to like It's like, uh, what is it? Beer fest. Yeah, like you remember things better 
yeah. in the same mindset that you learn it in. You yeah. drink to forget, but you always remember. True. <laughs> oh man, deep stuff, Jamie. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm I'm a psychology major, so I'm gonna bring up the deep. Hey, same. <laughs> Cheers, man. Cheers with my empty Rockstar can. Rockstar, sponsor me, damn it. <laughs> do it, Rockstar. Do it. I post yes. every time I do a photo shoot, I always pose with a Rockstar can. It's about <laughs> damn time you give me a lifetime supply of the energy. <laughs> damn it. So to bring this into sassy sassy land this is a question i ask in all of my interviews which you should be preparing for this one if i am interviewing you and you are stuck on this question oh man so we are in 2020 almost two months removed from pride month and who is always at the front of any pride parade drag queens yes so to put a modern day twist on an old question, if you were a drag queen, good sir, what would be your drag name? Ooh. Wasn't you were kidding. I didn't it. prepare for this question. Huh. Oh, you're good. It's a creative one. Because Ooh, like okay. everyone always pictures, you know, like the porn star question, but that's so generic. <laughs> This has some spice to it. We're not generic anymore. <laughs> no, you can't, would, cannot be I a basic say, Betsy. Going for a term I like to use when I write a lot of my guitar stuff, which is bouncy. I would say Mick Bouncy. Oh, I could dig it. Mick Bouncy, because if, if I were dancing to music as a drag queen, I would want to be dancing to stuff that makes me want to bounce up and down and dance around, you oh, know? Hell yeah. I see it. I see it. <laughs> hell yeah. But McBouncy. McBouncy. Mick, I think Jacobs was kind of was something like Jacqueline McNasty or something. Jacqueline McNasty. <laughs> something like I think, that. I think it was like Jacob Balls or something. I, I forget. Oh, <laughs> uh, we, I think I nicknamed him uh, in the bro job chat, Jacob Balls and Ass. I think it was like I think it was like Jacqueline Ball sack or something like that. I forget. Jacob, do not kill me for not remembering. Love you. <laughs> Chris said that's a good one. Ooh, my bouncy. drag name is Jane Doe, but Doe is spelled D-O-U-G-H because I cannot forget that I need to represent for my large and in charge and chunky yet funky people. Damn straight. <laughs> That's like the best explanation right there. Well, yeah. And very large, extra. Large and in charge. <laughs> chunky yet funky. Yes, I know. You could, uh, you could uh, get sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts and have uh, the Jane Donut. <laughs> yes. I live for Dunkin' Donuts. I literally live 0.47 miles from Dunkin' Donuts and I get that shit every morning. I don't oh. even think we have a Dunkin' Donuts near me. What? Like, you are missing out. Like Dunkin' yeah. Donuts, I'm not gonna like better than Starbucks. I've we're had gonna, the I've had the chilled package. coffee. I've had the chilled coffee back when I was at Moore Park College. <laughs> Choices. <laughs> Choices. Now with the way shipping's done? been with this freaking virus, I don't know if the donuts are gonna get to you in time before mm -mm. they go stale. Mm-mm. Yeah. That's why I'm going to stick with my flaming Hot Cheetos and my mac and cheese. There you go. <laughs> Cheyenne, would you like to ask the next question? Okay. So what have you been up to during quarantine and any new music in the works? So the start of quarantine, I, uh, I was, well, this was very early on, like before the, or I think it was like right after the national emergency was declared. Mm -hmm. um, I was driving Uber at the time and Ohio and Kentucky had not had any confirmed cases yet. So yeah. I was like, all right, I'm just going to keep an eye out. If it makes its way into Ohio and Kentucky, I'm just going to stop Ubering. Well, sure enough, like a week and a half later, there were mm -hmm. confirmed cases in both Ohio and Kentucky. So I was like, all right, I guess I'm done Ubering. I got to figure out like an income thing now. So I ended up, you know, this is where, I don't know. Amazon's such a love-hate relationship, but 
Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta have some income, you know? So I ended up going and applying and started working for Amazon at one of the warehouses they have over by the airport. Mm -hmm. um, I was just working part-time and then I like, so funny. I, I like waved to one of these like operations guys one day when I was just walking by them. I just like being friendly with people in the warehouse and they were like, Hey, uh, you want to do some safety stuff? And I was like, yeah, sure. And one thing led to another and I ended up getting like hired onto like the safety squad there. Mm -hmm. And now I like check people's temperatures all night pretty much and get paid more to do it. So somehow found myself in a better situation by just waving to a guy. <laughs> yeah. Always a good choice. Yeah. But outside of work, I've been, uh, I've been really like grinding on this new Cold Harbor stuff, honestly, like this, uh, well, I guess I'll just reveal it now. We have an album in the works. You probably heard my dog in the background. Yeah. <laughs> um, Spicy. But uh, we do have a new album in the works. We ha we're not releasing any information on it yet, um, but it is almost done and things are starting to get pushed out. So like we're getting active again and it really, really gets me freaking hyped. And also like we've been, we've been talking a lot about our marketing plan and stuff because Jake just recently told us that he's moving down to Florida. So we were like, okay, we got to like think about some things then and like figure out like what our plan is, which I guess, you know, it's a bummer because Jake's a great friend of ours, but also, you know, that's the bummer aspect of him moving. But since we're not playing shows right now, and we're probably not going to be playing shows until 2021. Um, it's probably better just to focus on the marketing aspect. And it's not like the end of the world that he's moving, you know, right. so we're just trying to spin it in more of a positive light and start putting more effort into our online presence and advertising and content generation. So that's what we're really buckling down on now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I know Jake, um, Jacob, when I had him on here the other day, um, he was telling me that a lot of the newer songs are focusing on a lot of big issues. Yes, um, yeah. I am personally very stoked to hear that. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the thing with Cold Harbor is we started it as like this for fun band, you know, but I guess being like the music guys we are like anything for fun is just inevitably going to turn into something serious no matter it doesn't it doesn't matter what you say when you're trying to start it like if music is your passion, you're going to take it serious for your entire existence pretty much. <laughs> um, but like I do like that like we're touching on serious stuff and I it kind of dry. I don't know. I feel a little more in touch with the stuff we're writing about now too, because it really, um, I can really connect with it. Like Jake and I, we pretty much like, we disagree on a lot of things, but we're still able to have conversations and have com share common ideas and talk about things openly as adults with each other. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I connect with that. Like I believe in that stuff and I wish there was more of that. And I think, you know, I hope that that's one thing that this new music kind of brings to light. Like not only is it like music that really grips you, but like I'm hoping that we paint a picture with this new stuff that really captures the audience, you know, like the sound, maybe it's the sound that draws them in first. Maybe it's the lyrics. Maybe it's the brutality of Jake's vocals. Like, but I want, I want there to be something, I want it to be like a home for people, you know, where I'm people sorry. can find some common ground and really understand each other under this like umbrella that we're painting. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that's really important in music. And it's something that I wouldn't say it's completely missing, but at the same time, like there's kind of like an elephant in the room that a lot of people aren't talking about. And it's really mm -hmm. nice to see that more bands, you know, like Cold Harbor, Sharp Tooth, others are actually bringing up like serious issues that are otherwise kind of just like shoved into the woodshed yeah and you know and like i don't know I, I i'm just a fan of like maybe maybe it makes me a little bit of a hippie but like i'm a posi vibes kind of guy here yeah so <laughs> anything that has to do with getting emotional and being a negative person i just think is so counterproductive 
to everything that we're and everything that the human race is about really you know yeah Completely honestly agree. like I, I think i think it pays to have rational calm civilized conversations with people because that's how brainstorming happens you know mm -hmm. certainly but so not only yeah. are you a talented uh guitarist you're also a very talented photographer and uh, thank you <laughs> there's three photographers in the room so I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go back into your history and kind of find out like where did you get started in photography um so I actually I was uh I started doing phone photography on my one of my old phones I was just like taking like stylized like looking <laughs> shots of things like my feet were wet one time and there was this cool looking stone um down at the lake that I was at and I like stepped on the stone and left this wet footprint and I was like that's kind of cool and took a picture of it and showed it to my buddy um like when I got home from the lake and he was like dude you're a really good photographer you should consider getting a camera and then the seed was planted mm -hmm. and <laughs> before I you know before I knew it I ended up getting this uh it was a Nikon D5500 camera Ooh. Yeah, I, I love that camera, honestly. It was like 24 megapixels, and it's like a middle-of-the-road camera. It didn't run me that much money. And I took so many freaking pictures on that thing. <laughs> but uh, I actually, I, I got a couple pictures of the Eclipse back in 2017 that were on that. Um, but then, I don't know, that, that camera was a crop sensor camera. And also, like, there was something about Nikon's color profile that I just wasn't the biggest fan of. Like, in the raw photos, everything was just kind of dull, you know? You really had to work with it to get it to where you wanted it. And you could very easily overwork a picture if you're not careful with Nikon mm -hmm. pictures. And so I, uh, you know, a, a few buddies of mine had been shooting with uh, Canon cameras. And I really liked their default color profile, like right out of the box. I was like, oh, this is going to be so much easier to edit. So I eventually bit the bullet and I bought a Canon 60 camera. And now I shoot on that. And that's some of the photos that you've been seeing now. Hell yeah. The Canon makes an excellent camera. I, I currently shoot on the uh, Canon crop myself, the ADD. Um, yes but I use an ultra wide angle um, zoom lens, which is an 18 to 35, which is like, nice. it's like perfect for shows. Cause I do more like shows and portraits, which I think you do more like portraiture and landscape. Or do you yeah, also it's do like, yeah, it's like a combination of the two, I would say. Yeah. So what's like the biggest piece of advice you would give any photographer kind of starting out in the scene? I would say just like, don't be afraid of like all the controls on the camera. There's always going to be someone that you can bounce things off of. Like, but you gotta be willing to talk to people and like be open to learning, you know, cause there's a lot of stuff. Every camera is a little bit different with like what controls control what, and there's a learning curve with that. So you have to be a little bit patient with it as you're shooting. Like you're not going to be like adjusting your, the exposure of your camera, like on the fly, as you're taking pictures, you're going to have to like, take some test shots and get used to the camera because I had to do the same thing. And that's just really like kind of what I draw from. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Especially when you change venues every time. Oh my God. Live photography, live music photography is so tough because every venue's lighting is completely different. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> like nine times out of 10, like you weren't even getting the real lighting scenario until the band actually starts playing, you know? Oh Yeah. Because they'll have like all the general lights on in the venue and then they'll turn them off and then it's all flashing and the lighting scenario is completely different. <laughs> Not even considering the fact indoor and outdoor. Mm -hmm. oh, I do think Jimmy. outdoor is better though if it's not nighttime. Yeah, yeah nighttime, oh, yeah. outdoor. Ooh. Although I think the shots you can get nighttime outdoor are sick though. Like True. if you get some good shots, those are like the ones you want to like print off, you know? One of my favorites here is Fountain Square when it used to be a thing. Yeah. That was one of my favorites, starting out anyway. I've been down there for a couple of concerts. 
what was it when i shot you guys over at that now to give you guys some context of what this venue was like it was just a street address and you had to like kind of like look around the building to try to find where this room was and then you walked up the flight of stairs there was like a small stage in like a corner and that's where that's where bro job played um there was like a little small stage in the corner maybe four back lights and no frontal lighting <laughs> so true it's i you know i just saw a meme on facebook like yesterday that was like venue owner <laughs> He's standing there just staring at the band intensely and the band's like, is this the stage? And it's just this little corner. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. That's that. what, was it Santa Ana? Yep. That, okay, yeah. Yep. I always get Santa Ana and Cupertino mixed up. Because Cupertino, we played at like this bowling alley. It was really bizarre. Really? Yeah. And Kill had to like shorten their set because we were only allowed to play until bowling league started so but i guess they didn't shut down general bowling soon enough so it cut into the show time so we didn't have like kill didn't have enough time to play their full set so they played like two songs oh That's those bad. guys are such yeah. sweethearts i That's love the horrible of those guys i miss yeah, them they're so much. kind souls <laughs> they're very kind souls i miss them spencer alex kaylin glenn and Mike? I think it was Michael. I think. Oh, I probably got his name wrong. I am so terrible with names, but I miss the fuck out of those guys. They're all super, super cool. And they actually just uh, dropped a new music video like, I think it was like a month and a half ago, and it's sick. Oh, hell yeah. I'll, I may just have to get Kalen on here because he's he's the one member I kind of stay somewhat in contact with, so may have okay. to get Kalen on here soon. They're all super <laughs> chill people. So, there you yes. Go. So you recently posted a time lapse photo that was uh, you're extremely proud of. How did you create the photo, and what's been the feedback on it been like? Oh man, so that photo. Um, well, so it was like I was I was on vacation uh, down in Florida with my family uh, actually last week, and the place that we were staying at the sky was so clear and it was like right on the ocean. It was just like the perfect view, the per honestly, like the most relaxing vacation I've had in years. And the sky was just perfectly clear out. And I was just waiting. I took this lightning photo down in Hilton head. I saw that a whole, a couple years ago. And it was just one of the most incredible photos I'd ever taken at the time. And it really opened up my, my eyes to like lightning and storm photography. And I was like, oh man, what if like a, what if a storm blows up off the coast here? We got like the perfect view, like 24 seven. So I was waiting all week and there were like some storms that were like out there, you could see them, but there wasn't really anything close enough that was like throwing visible sticks of lightning. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah oh, man. And then like, it was like this, our second to last night there, this storm blew in and my mom was like, Josh, you gotta come out here right now. The storm is like awesome. And I was looking at it for a second and I was like halfway drunk at this point. Like I was drinking Coronas all night <laughs> when in Florida, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, I, for anyone who's Florida. concerned with me, by the way, the place in Florida that we were at was not populated at all. Like you could social distance completely fine and everyone was wearing their masks. So it was really, really chill and relaxing there. Um, but Back to the picture. So <laughs> my memory card on my camera, I, uh, I haven't, I've been shooting on that memory card for a long time. It probably has like well over 10,000 shots on it and it's starting to slow down. Like when I do long exposures now, mm -hmm. so I was taking 30 second exposures and I dialed in the light for that on my camera. But for every 30 second exposure, it took about 30 seconds to process the picture. So really for every picture, it took about a minute to take, Jeez. but I was snapping pictures like whenever I could to try mm -hmm. and catch one of these sticks. But every time the picture would be done, like right when the shutter would close, there would be this insane stick of lightning that would come out of the cloud. And I'd be like, God damn it. <laughs> 
See, that's why I want to attach a gro- GoPro to any time I go to shows or do any like long exposure photography. Just to be like, this is what I go through, and then this is the shot that en- I end up with. Yes. Like, how? Yes, exactly. It's the struggle. Yeah, <laughs> life of photographers. Right. We are in constant pain. Right. I'll get well, you want to talk about pain. You want to talk about pain? When I was shooting Architects last year. The crowd oh. servers were coming over at like a very fast rate to the point where like security were like falling back into us photographers. I got pushed up against the stage like 15 times. That's courageous of you. Cause you may have like crowd surfers like kicking you in the head and shit. See, the reason I got my <laughs> concussion wasn't even because of a crowd surfer. It was because a band, two bands in a row, vocalists jumped off the stage and bulldozed into my cue ball head. God damn. Like, well, I don't hey, know, you know what? what it is. Your head is really important because it helped hold those vocalists up from <laughs> falling and hitting the floor and hurting themselves and hindering the rest of the tour. You really saved the tour. Your head did. Touche. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so I, anyway, long story short, I eventually ended up getting that shot and, uh, It took about like an hour and a half of like snapping pictures and I finally got it. And I was like, holy fuck. Finally, I was just jumping up and down like super, super. The money shot. You got the shot and then you pull like a, wait a damn minute. Yeah. And the the coolest thing about it was so, because it was dark and I didn't really have a reference point. I had to manually focus my camera. I didn't really have any good reference point to like focus my camera on like for the horizon. So there were these people that were about uh, probably like a couple football fields away out on the beach with their flashlights. And I focused on their flashlights to try and get them as sharp as possible in the frame. And then apparently that was like the perfect focus for the clouds. So that's got lucky. It's, it's a beautiful <laughs> shot. If you want to see the shot, go up on Josh's social media. It's at me on oh, Facebook. Yes. 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 Those photos are honestly money shots because, you know, you always think like, am I going to get this shot? And then, especially when it comes to music photography, because you don't really have a whole lot of time to reset. Right. And then you're just like, oh my God, let me get this shot. (laughs) And the lags on the camera. Worth it though. Exactly. You get that good shot and you're just like, holy shit, this is the best shot ever. Thank you. Like when I got that one shot of ginger. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, oh, the band ginger? Yeah. I thought you were talking about Jacob for a second. I thought you said the ginger. And I was like, oh, the ginger. <laughs> I'm talking to you, beach. Love you, Jacob. <laughs> so ginger. we're going to go to a more serious note right now. I'm sorry to burst the bubble, but we're going to switch, switch it. I'm serious. So we're currently in quarantine, but we're also... The mental health realm is really struggling right now because while we have quarantine going on, we're also dealing with the biggest civil rights movement since like the 60s. Yes. What's like, how important do you think it is for people to get involved right now? I think it's extremely important for people to get involved, but I also think people need to like, not take it for the face value. There's real, there's real issues that need to be addressed that aren't being talked about by mainstream media. And I think that's, personally, I think that's a, re- a really kind of destructive um, narrative that's surrounding this movement because there's real systemic issues in society that it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not a blame game. It doesn't matter who, I mean, you know, if you could look back and say it does matter who, you know, implemented these measures that made society was what it is today, but pointing the finger at someone isn't going to solve anything. Like it's important to just acknowledge the issues so that these issues can get solved instead of exacerbating the issue by not facing it head on, you know? Oh, certainly. Also, I, you know, my opinion is, is one, and this is why I, I really hesitate to talk about this stuff on my social media, because I think my opinion is often a misunderstood one. Yeah. Um, because obviously I think black lives matter. I think, I think all black lives matter, you know, mm-hmm. 
but that's but my issue is like it just seems like all you see is like people talking about police brutality which is a real problem but there's mm-hmm. more than that you know Certainly. it's not just about it's not just about police brutality in my mind like so i mean you know without getting too into the weeds that's pretty much where i'm at with it yeah i think all black lives matter and i think there's I think there's real societal issues that need to be talked about. Um, you know, like the black family unit, you know, it, it's it's totally torn apart right now, you know? Oh, certainly. And it needs like, and honestly, I think the family unit in the United States is torn apart. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the, I don't, I haven't seen the divorce rate recently, but I think it was around like 70% or something. It's extremely high because people just don't care anymore. They want, you know, out of it, basically. Right. And like, I don't know, like, I I just, I just think about like, okay, where would I be, you know, today if I didn't have my dad in my life? You know, if I just had my mom, I would still be a good person, I feel like, because my mom is a great person, but I wouldn't be the same as I am now without my dad. You know, I feel like I'm a strong believer in like the, you're born, you're, you become what your past experiences are and what you learn in life, like tabula rasa stuff. And I, I don't know, I truly believe that. And I think you, you know, obviously you pull from your parents' personalities a little bit because I definitely would not be the same person without, you know, it doesn't matter if it's without my mom or without my dad, like, they both contributed equally to the person I am today. And I'm really, really thankful for that, honestly. Like, I just think divorce rates are way too high and the nuclear family needs to like get back oh, to certainly. what it was, you know? Certainly. And it doesn't matter, like the sexual orientation doesn't matter too. I don't know why the government has to have a stance on that. I don't understand why people can't just do what they do what they feel, be them, you know, be themselves and be peaceful and be at peace with everyone around them and themselves. Cause I think that's healthy. And I think that's probably a better way of addressing mental health. And I think too, it's like the politics and religion are always talked about and they want to, the politics want to bring in the religion. Yeah. You know? And like, I, you know, I, I was a Catholic school kid growing up. So I, and I've really kind of, I think I've become a little bit disenfranchised from religion just by virtue of like growing up in that environment. Um, but I pulled morals from it that I kind of hold pretty close to myself. Like love your neighbor as yourself. That's pretty simple, you know? Exactly. Like why, and there's obviously there's, there's a whole bunch of contrary beliefs and hypocrisy within it nowadays that like are ultimately the things that disenfranchised me. Like you say, love your neighbor as yourself, but now the Bible, now, you know, the Bible and people are interpreting the Bible as saying that it's not okay to be gay. Like what, what, what sense does that make? Obviously that's hypocrisy. Yeah. You know, so there, you kind of have to, I think you just kind of have to draw from the larger morals, which is love everyone, period. We're all human. Who cares what we are like who cares what who cares what you think who cares what i think Mm -hmm. we think what we we believe what we believe because we have i don't think cheyenne or jamie you would believe what you guys believe for reasons that you don't think are good you know like we all believe what we believe because we think the reasons behind what we believe are good yeah exactly yeah so what why not have a conversation you know that's why where i'm like you know we got to have conversations on that premise like oh certainly and that's that's why we kind of started up this podcast to have genuine conversations to keep the conversation going because just cutting someone off because they have differing viewpoints isn't going to lead us anywhere we're all adults we need we all have our own opinions doesn't mean that the other person's wrong doesn't mean they're right either right yeah. And I, ultimately, I think it's just, you don't have to, I, I don't think like, you know, obviously, and I, I guess this is another reason why I don't like post a lot about this stuff on my social media, because it's no one's business, but mine, you know, like, I'm not trying to make people believe what I believe. I totally accept what other people believe. Maybe I don't understand 
fully what everyone else believes, but I'm mm. not going to have a problem with it. And I'm not going to try to force what I believe upon them because I know ultimately like everyone that I respect as a person, and I respect most people as a person, like you, there, I think there's like a line you have to cross with me to really make me be like, okay, what's your issue? <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah. Where you look at the person like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, I, I, I just, I think everyone should be accepted. It, it doesn't matter what the little details are, what the semantics are. And you know what, that's, that's another reason why I love music because these, these topics are so hard to talk about. I feel like it's so hard to talk about amongst people with differing viewpoints mm -hmm. nowadays when the premise of the conversation is the core, the avocado pit of the conversation, you know? Yeah. 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 The, the part that everyone disagrees on in some way, shape or form. And like, that's why I think like, that's why I believe in the music that I play and that Cold Harbor is writing and the topics we're making ourselves about because music is something that everyone can connect on. You know, it's a different premise for a conversation. You know, maybe it's the sound that hits you first. Maybe it's the lyrics. Everyone's into it for a different reason and you can start talking about it, you know? Exactly. Definitely. Um, shout out to Dom513. He says, hell yeah, Josh. Hell yeah, and, Dom. And and uh, Christine, of course, I completely agree with you there. She said yeah. media is making a two-sided thing when it's humanity and society issues, societal issues. Exactly. Yeah, and like, Jacob and, I, and you know what? You know what the funny thing is too. I think the media only pays attention to the extremists on both sides when really everyone in the middle is like, "What the fuck is going on?" Exactly. What is problem. <laughs> yeah, Jacob and I were kind of talking about that the other day, where it's like the media, like something that I realized from taking a few different courses like rhetoric of pop culture and also taking like my research in statistical methods class is like the, the media on both sides takes like a story and they're gonna kind of like break it apart and reform it to form the narrative that they want to right you're not really getting the genuine full story if you notice uh -huh. any kind of like mass media you consume nowadays it drums up your emotions you oh, know? Yeah. of course it does that's just like the proclivity that's like human nature you want to get emotional about the topics you care about but it's really important not to get emotional and if you are in marketing it, because both sides have biases you know well certainly and that's something that i've always like that especially recently i've been trying to kind of preach preach about is just like don't get like don't get too heated boo just look at the source right facts Right. Facts are facts. Exactly. Facts don't care about anyone's feelings, period. So now that you've been touring for a little bit, uh, what are some dream venues you'd like to play at eventually? You know what? I, uh, oh God, where did, hold on. I'm going to have to look this up really quick. Um, God, where was that Bring Me the Horizon concert that they played that was like filmed and it, they had like the orchestral I think, it was um, like Wembley, I think it was like Wembley Hall or something like that Wembley Hall yeah Wem uh, Wembley Stadium yeah that's in, it uh what I think it was like La London yeah oh my god I would love to play there one day there, there or like Madison Square Garden Ooh, like I want to play at a place where like the sound of Cold Harbor like I know, you know, every, every band has to go through the hoops yeah. to get to somewhere, you know, and I really feel like Cold, Cold Harbor is on a path that's laid out for us. Um, like, I just write this music thinking about venues like that, where like, yeah. the atmosphere is really created by the size of the venue, you know, and yeah. like, if it has a fucking intense sound system and is like decently well insulated, not unlike u.s bank arena <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 it's uh what or is, is it, it called now? now no 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 um i'll have to come back to that because it's not what it's called anymore but it used to be u.s bank <laughs> you, you know no. what i'm talking about yeah that. but um what about bogarts bogarts is amazing i i i love bogarts but They're... uh <laughs> bogarts doesn't cut it <laughs> i can definitely see you guys playing the glass house out here 
that place has. An oh, incredible. I think I've heard of that place before. Yeah, it's, it's an 800 capacity venue over in Pomona and um, two stories, uh, usually merch is on the second story. Uh, stage is pretty decently sized. It's kind of like in the corner, but it's a really, it's a good sized stage, especially. Oh for- man. Wait, did the Acacia Strain film a video there? They did. Yes, they've. Um, I've seen them. I've I've um seen like tour tours go through there with Acacia Strain several times. Um, I got to see them there in 2018 when they played Continent in its entirety. Oh. With after the burial playing um, reform or re- reformer, or, their 2008 album. Um, they were um, so after the burial was playing their 2008 album in its entirety, and the Acacia Strain was doing Continent in its entirety, co-headlined at the Glass. That was probably one of the most insane shows I've ever seen there. But oh my God, that sounds incredible. Sound system wise, you definitely get like some of the most beefy sound from that venue. Um, Heritage Bank Center is what it's called now. Oh, yeah. Who knows? It's oh, eighty-six clubs because banks are the ones that have all the monies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Christine says play Webster Hall in New York, recently remodeled. Ooh. Ooh. And then Doom, and then Mr. Doom says the eighty-six club. Where is that? 86 oh. club it's in cincinnati oh i think it's like uh uc area yeah my uh my old band the few the fallen used to play there a lot oh hell yeah um, back when uh there was a guy named chris human in the local scene that ran that and before that he ran this bigger venue up in a uh, fairfield ohio called the underground uh forest park yeah 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 forest park yeah. Yeah, I actually ended up seeing Red Jumpsuit there in college and Ooh, with, with, oh, well, it was okay. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, jumpsuit is what they are, but um, I was just. <laughs> God, throwing shade. I love them to death. Don't get me wrong, but that was the first time I've ever seen them. And I ended up photographing them. And I'm actually friends with uh, the guitarist, uh, Randy. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, Facebook, Facebook, and Facebook I, friends mostly, and the their photographer um, Justin. And I, oh, <laughs> yeah. You know what was weird? Speaking of like weird, weird ways of connecting and stuff, and like meeting people. This, this is another thing I love about music. It's just all the people you meet. But there was a. I don't know if you guys remember that band Brightwell. Yep. Um, and Nick Barham was their vocalist, and he was the vocalist. He was like the in-between section vocalist in Attack Attack. Yep. Oh God. And uh, and they came, they came down, they were touring with Ice Nine Kills, and the old manager, <gasps> the manager from my old band, um, guest listed me for that show uh, with uh, Brightwell and Ice Nine Kills. It was at the Madison Theater in Covington, Kentucky. How long ago is and- this? I want to say like 2013, 2014. That's what I was thinking. I think it was like 2015. Yeah, around there. Who else was on the tour? It was a. Uh, it was Ice Nine Kills, Brightwell. You said it was at the theater or Madison Live. Madison Live. Oh, I didn't. I was gonna go to that, but I ended up having to work the next, oh. like early the next day. Damn. I've done shows like that where I don't get home until like two in the morning, then I have to work at like 9 45 the next day. Yeah, well, I worked at the aquarium at the time. Oh. So I had to be there at like seven o'clock in the morning. Oh no, fuck that. Mm-hmm. That sounds like and I lived half an hour. Yeah, no, fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> Being the supervisor, the photography department, no. Since I had to be the first one in, I'll pass. See, there's tons oh. of venues out in like the LA area, like Southern California wise that for up and coming bands especially would be like bucket lists like checkoffs like whiskey a go-go roxy chain reaction uh eventually when you end up playing yeah that when i was when i saw you where you guys were playing in santa Ana, i was like this tour could have gone through chain damn let's see um eventually house of blues anaheim that that's a huge venue heard of that one too and they recently so they moved it 
it used to be in downtown Disney and now they moved it kind of like about a mile away in like this new promenade area. And the new room is 2,200 capacity and is like massive. God damn. I, you know what? I, I, I tell, I tell my friends this, but like you guys have seen game of Thrones, right? Yep. So spoiler alert for anyone <laughs> who has not seen game of Thrones that episode where uh, Cersei has to do her walk of atonement, you know, where everyone's like throwing tomatoes at her and screaming, screaming all these obscenities and stuff. I, I feel like right now, like granted, like we haven't done anything to deserve this. No one has, but I also feel like Cold Harbor and Bro Job are like on our walks of atonement right now. Everyone that's taking this seriously needs to like, I think there's opportunities to be had in this pandemic because everyone's online now. It's pretty, you know, everyone's a captive audience. Yeah. You know exactly where your audience is going to be. So all you have to do is start like putting together like ads to find those people that you think would dig your music or whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think, I think that plays into the whole idea we were talking about before we started podcasting of the, we're entering this like new Renaissance period, Mm -hmm. you know? but yeah, getting deep. <laughs> I will say about these weird ads I keep getting on my Facebook. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen my videos of me. Yes. But, um, <laughs> so I keep getting these hair ads on my Facebook of a shirtless guy with like a bunch of like tattoos just quaffing his hair. And I, I, I end up like recording like a video of me just like reacting to it because they come up on my Facebook at least like once a week now. And um, I just I keep going like, again, a fucking gan. <laughs> Y'all know I'm bald as shit and I'm gonna keep shaving my head until I die. So. <laughs> or wear wigs. Yeah, you can post, you can uh, report it as spam or if you don't think you're the target audience of that ad oh i've done it before they keep coming back (laughs) first it came from target then it came from the actual hair page and i was just like (gasps) hello (laughs) oh my god hello (laughs) choices (laughs) <laughs> so moving on so we got two more um just so we can wrap it up a little bit uh what would be like where do you see yourself with the groups um bro job and cold harbor uh individual and as a group in five to ten years like pre-covid i've thought about this a lot and bro job i want to continue touring like obviously i take a more kind of a uh, secondary approach to bro job like i i'm more of like one of the backseat members where i play live and i do some marketing for us when we are on the road but that's about the role that i play in bro job um but bro job i want to i want to because this new album we're we're coming out with which oh i guess we're coming out with a new album. What? <laughs> huh. You spilled the tea. Oops. Oh, girl, girl, just spill it all. Just dunk. <laughs> Oops. But yeah, we're. <laughs> and don't worry, Jacob said it the other day too, so you fine. Oh, he's good then. Okay, I'll blame it all on him. <laughs> just shove him into the river. <laughs> this yeah, not the Ohio. Is fucking sick. It is so, oh man, it is like, you thought Talk Shit Get Kissed was like a good album. Like this stuff is going to blow your mind. It like, you listen to it and you're just like, oh man, like right when the Bring song. Bring on the fucking beef. <laughs> that, that, that beef is in multiple different ways. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, I guess my vision is just because people already show up to bro job shows and stuff. So I'm just stoked to like, play those songs you know because i think people will continue to show up and like once they hear these new songs i think it's going to be just i think it's going to reignite the fire a little bit oh yeah i'm Um, supposed to hear that re-recorded version of tough love i'm prepared it's it's really heavy but um but then cold harbor obviously like i guess i just always take a more like intimate view on cold harbor because it's like my baby you know it's everything I've wanted to do and uh 
with Cold Harbor, I really want to be at like the bro job point with Cold Harbor in three years, I would say. And I think we can get there as long as we just stay diligent and keep putting money into it. And, you know, you get out what you put in. And that's kind of something that I'm starting to come with grip, come to grips with in life. So I don't know. And having like the dream team surrounding us, like Jacob is phenomenal. Drew on drums is insane. Uh, we actually, Chris Lawrence, our old bassist is doing, he's going to be programming all of our lights for us. We have this insane light show we're putting together now. Oh, that's shit. all going to be designed by Chris. And then now it's going to be a pleasing for photographers. Right. Yeah. And it'll be a consistent light show every night. And, uh, and then our new bassist, Tyler is going to just be, he's just everything we, we, we wanted on bass. So it's really, it's, it's coming together. You know, I'm really happy with the people that and the team we're building and the people we're surrounding ourselves with. So I guess it's only up from here, but that's kind of where I want it to be in three, three years, I would say. Hell yeah. Well, I'm so plan. I mean, if it takes five years, it'll take five years, but I'm not going to give up. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm stoked to see where you guys go. Not only yeah, with completely. Job, Cold Harbor. Um, I, I remember when I just went up to the road job um, booth and I was just like, I'm buying both of these CDs. And you're like, well, howdy, how are you? <laughs> it's so funny, dude. Like when, when you're operating the merch booth, it just some of the conversations just become rinse, repeat a little bit. And you don't mean for it to because you don't want to be a non genuine person, you know. But sometimes it's just like, wait, I've said that before. God damn it. <laughs> I felt that on a spiritual level. I know. It's like you can only say so many, so many of the same things. But also, I do like just talking to people and meeting people. I played this, I played a game of pool with this guy in North Carolina. He was a scary looking motherfucker, honestly. This guy, was, <laughs> he was a badass. And he challenged me. He was like, I'll, uh, hey, you play guitar and bro job, right? I was like, yeah. And he was like, you want to play a game of pool? I'll put five bucks down. You put five bucks down and I'll play with one arm. And if you beat me, you get the whole pot. And I was like, okay, I mean, I could, I could beat anyone with one arm. Like I'm, okay at pool so <laughs> this guy was really good like it got down to the eight ball and he was he almost beat me with one arm and but I ended up I ended up winning somehow I just told him like dude keep the five dollars keep your five dollars you thoroughly impressed me <laughs> yeah that's so I made friends had a had a drink and it was super chill but I don't know I would have never connected with that guy if it wasn't for music you know yeah and I have the same, I have the same kind of stories where like my best friend, like one of my best friends, Matt, which yeah. who I'll have on the podcast soon, hopefully. Um, he's um, another concert photographer. And we actually met on my first assignment for the camera effect back in like 2017, which was Ooh. the 10 years of the cleansing tour, Suicide Silence. Wow. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. And we actually met like, this venue d doesn't have a photo pit so we were just like shooting like from the stairs not trying trying not to get trampled from the fucking audience <laughs> because of, from the flames because like the audiences go fucking nuts at sold out whiskey shows like oh, you yeah. put you put alcohol <laughs> in <laughs> oh yeah it's whiskey a go-go like it's like literally this venue could not be shut down because it is a registered landmark basically oh, bogarts damn yeah like it's literally a registered landmark of West Hollywood. Like it'll never get shut down. So yeah, that show was so nuts. So we were like shooting from like upstairs and like the stairs area. Sick. And we ended, so dope. we ended up just meeting and now we literally text each other every day. So I feel yeah. that. I would have never met you, Jamie, if, if it wasn't for music. Yeah, exactly. And Cheyenne, I can't. Dude, <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about that right now. <laughs> We'll talk about it post podcast because I know this. <laughs> oh, you guys may have to remind me because we still oh, remind you. I'll spill. <laughs> oh, girl, I ain't gonna throw shade. I'll throw the whole damn tree. What's up? Well. <laughs> but where can people find your music? Like on like what platforms and such? Uh, so we're on all the both Bro Job and Cold Harbor are on all the major platforms. Um, 
Spotify, Apple Music, Google Music, I think like Amazon, YouTube, obviously, uh, Facebook. We have little clips on Instagram. Um, but just, we try to just kind of cast out the whole net and be everywhere, you know? Yeah, definitely. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for watching. Uh, this has been yes. an amazing podcast episode. And um, everyone that commented. Yeah, d- yeah, very much interactive today, which I'm very happy about. And I'm stoked to see where both Bro Job and Cold Harbor go from here. And I'm stoked thank to you. hear those new releases. Thank you, dude. Yeah, it's been chill being on here with you guys. You guys are super awesome. Good to reconnect, too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you again for tuning in to the Camera Fetch podcast. My name is Jamie, as always. Uh, Cheyenne. Joined with Cheyenne and Josh. And hope you all have an excellent rest of your evening. Stay in meth and don't do school. <laughs> <laughs>